on the agenda. Here we go. So we had a uh, work session or a uh, exec session earlier. Uh, we didn't have anything to come out uh, of that tonight. So I'll convene the work session for the Oregon City Commission for Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. Call roll, please. Commissioner Rachel Lyle Smith. Here. Commissioner Frank O'Donnell. Here. Commissioner Rocky Smith. Here. Commissioner Denise McGriff. Present. Mayor Dan Holliday. Here. So first up, uh, future agenda items, Mr. Conkle. We have the, the list of um, work session items that have been requested by the commission, as well as uh, what we anticipate to bring forward. Um, I don't have anything else to add at this point. Okay. And moving on, uh, discussion items. We have 19737, the library board annual update. Ms. Cole and Mr. Edwards. Good evening, commission. I am happy to, um, it's your favorite time of the year. Don't hold your breath, it's the library board report and I'm happy to introduce Scott Edwards, our chair, to present that to you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Holliday and commissioners. As Mo said, my name is Scott Edwards and I am a resident of the Caulfield neighborhood and I am currently chair of the library board. This year begins my second four year term. For background, the library board consists of seven members, four from the city, two from outside the city, and one at large. Our members represent the 34,610 residents in city and the 24,975 residents in unincorporated Clackamas County that are in the Oregon City Library Service District. You all received the uh, report on the library board's activity in 2019. And now I will uh, briefly go over that and then answer any questions that you may have. One of the board's tasks is to actively communicate with other local library related groups. And so we have three board members who are liaisons with other community uh, groups and government committees. Uh, our representatives from the library board meet monthly with these groups. They actively contribute and then report back to the library board every month. Uh, currently, we have representatives with the Oregon City Library Foundation, the Friends of the Oregon City Library, and LDAC, the Library District Advisory Committee. Uh, this year, the board also worked with the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association and the Kanema Neighborhood Association uh, in conjunction with the library to revise our policies and to provide uh, the opportunity for community groups to be able to use the meeting space in the library uh, before and after uh, regular library hours. Um, on the 2019 Library Board uh, activity report that you received, you can see all of the policies, plans, and reviews that were conducted last year. Uh, we worked with Mo to create an annual schedule uh, for all of these tasks to be completed throughout the year and every year going forward. Uh, these include review of our bylaws, uh, the American Library Association policies, the strategic plans, um, and the annual budget. Uh, also, every library policy uh, will also be reviewed and revised if necessary uh, at least once every three years. Among uh, other tasks that the library board does every year uh, is a yearly tour of the library facilities and regular reports from library staff heading the major divisions within the library. Um, as Mo is, is sadly leaving us for a well-deserved retirement, uh, earlier last year we had uh, lengthy discussions about what we would like to see uh, in our next library director. And board member Carrie Linder was our representative on the first interview panel uh, for the new library director. And so that's a, a brief summary of 2019. Um, as for 2020, the board will be saying goodbye to Mo and welcoming incoming library director Greg Williams. We will be conducting our annual reviews and reports. We will be continuing to meet regularly with community groups and government committees. 
and as uh, well, we'll be addressing some issues facing all libraries in Clackamas County and, and likely working with those libraries uh, in regards to issues as of funding, uh, library service area boundaries, and uh, the possible elimination of fines and late fees. So that is an update on the library board and I would be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Questions? No. Oops, um, Scott, what, um, what uh, types of community groups are you meeting? Are you meeting? You so say you're gonna be meeting more with more community groups? Are you, are you thinking about meeting with any of the neighborhood associations? Uh, well, we are going to continually uh, meeting with the Friends of the Library and the Library Foundation and LDAC. Um, and if there are any major issues that the library uh, needs community feedback, then yes, it would, we would, uh, the first thing would be to go to the neighborhood groups. Okay. And I know we've had the neighborhood uh, associations as well come to our meetings. Yeah. Okay, super. Thank so you. I spend my days in Canby, and there has been some rumbling out in Canby land about uh, uh, trying to access more of the, the area that Oregon City is currently covered in and transferring that to Canby. Are those discussions going on or? Yes, yes. Uh, I haven't, there was an update on that today. I haven't had a well, chance to that, see it. Uh, the formal discussion, thank you for redoing that. The formal discussion will take place um, when some group discussions called big task force uh, meetings will start in, I believe, January or February. And so this will fall under that umbrella so that all the libraries can be available to talk about this because it's not just an issue here, it's an issue elsewhere. Sure. So we want to do that as a whole group. Canby is trying to get that out ahead of time because they really want some of our territory and yes. our money, but <laughs> yeah. So who makes the final decision? on when those discussions on, on, no, take place? On the territories. Well, that, uh, the Board of County Commissioners would make that final distinction because it is a um, library district issue. Okay. But, I mean, they want input from everybody and um, I think it's probably a really good discussion to have about what the criteria are for deciding those service area boundaries. All right. Anybody else? Dan, just to follow up on your question, so, can be as concerned about well the, the, so our service area goes literally almost to the border of the city of Canby in some okay. spots and they're thinking that because they, they have a new library too right. and they're thinking that they should have more of that those of people should be uh, uh, attributed to the Canby library rather than the Oregon city library so but it's also an issue about some dollars then as well well yeah very much population so. equals dollars okay <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, sir. If I could just real quickly, you know, obviously thanking Mo for all yeah. the work that she's done here, but I would also like to recognize um, this was not planned for tonight, but um, <laughs> Mr. Greg Williams, our, our new library director, who will be starting um, January 27th, so he has four days to absorb all of Mo's grace and knowledge and swear words. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big move for him, all the way from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. That is true. Yeah. He could just roll down. <laughs> all right, um, that's that. Uh, moving on to 19728, request to designate the Buena Vista Social Clubhouse located at 1601 Jackson Street, Ms. Turway. Thank you very much. I'm here just to talk to you a little bit about a request that we had received to place the Buena Vista Clubhouse on the National Register of Historic Places. The city, this structure is located in Atkinson Park, which is at 1601 Jackson Street. Um, tonight, I just wanna talk about, acknowledge that we received a copy of this nomination and tell you what the process of review is and then what your role as well as the role of HRB will be in that process. I do not intend to talk about the actual nomination at all, just acknowledging the process. And then later I'll tell you kind of when um, we'll get to talk about the content in a little more detail. Um, but the one thing I did want to acknowledge about the nomination is it's for the structure only. It's not for the land beneath the structure, it's just for that building. So um, 
the request was to nominate the building and it was based on uh, social history criteria and there's different things that you can qualify for. This is association with social history and I'm gonna read for you the three items that were identified in the nomination or the request, which was the significance based on one, an association with civic and social events that demonstrate a significant pattern of events within the Buena Vista neighborhood and greater McLaughlin neighborhood. Number two, it's the only non-residential building that remains from Buena Vista neighborhood and thus stands as a surviving example of civic activity in the Buena Vista neighborhood before it was absorbed into the greater McLaughlin neighborhood. And lastly, that the building retains integrity and has been minimally altered since the period of significance, which is 1930 to 1968. Um, so for the nomination, essentially you go on a list and um, there are benefits to being designated. One is recognition, obviously there's some pride and you can put a plaque on the building identifying the status as well. Second is grant eligibility. There's a Preserving Oregon grant. That's a competitive grant. So just because you're on the list means you're eligible to apply. It does not mean that you will get dollars. There's still more asks and there is money to fund. And the third one is building code leniency. There is a provision in the building code where you can receive waivers for certain building code requirements in the interest of preserving the historic integrity of the structure. There's a restriction that comes with the designation as well. And that restriction is that there is going to be, there would be local review for demolition or relocation of the structure. Um, and so what happens is you would have a public hearing. That public hearing would be held by the Historic Review Board and they would look at a specific set of factors. We also have demolition review locally. This is not that criteria, this is separate demolition review um, that comes specifically associated with this program. So local governments review that. Um, we're a certified local government, and so that's part of that. So the process for this review of if it should be designated or not, the application gets turned in, we've been notified, and so then there'll be a State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation Geez, that is a long name. There's no short, I was trying to ask if there's a short name for that, but they call it S-A-C-H-P, which is not shorter. Um, so I'm just gonna call it the state for the moment for this presentation, but there, there's gonna be a state meeting and it's gonna be held in late February. They're gonna be the ones to make a recommendation. And um, after they make that recommendation, it could be to approve or approve with conditions kind of thing. So revise your nomination to clarify some things. Then the person who, the group that submitted the application will have 90 days to make any revisions if they have to make any revisions and then it goes to the National, National Park Service and then the National Park Service has 45 days to make a decision after that. So it's a fairly short timeline. So what is our role in all of this? So our role is twofold. One is because we're a certified local government, Historic Review Board is going to review the request for nomination. I'll talk to you a little bit more about what they're going to do on that, but the purpose of all of this local review is just to be the boots on the ground, local experts, as to if the information in the nomination is correct and if we can provide any local lens on the application. So divorce yourself from the fact that we actually own the building. As the local government and the historic review board, you get an opportunity to provide comment if you want to. You do not have to provide comment if you do not want to. Um, and then the city, what's written in the requirements is the chief local officer also has that ability to look at the nomination, look at the applicable criteria and provide comment as well. Um, this is going to be, a, well, you know, we have some time, but not a whole lot of time. So we've informed both you as well as the historic review board that this nomination exists and the process moving forward. Historic Review Board is going to hold a public hearing and decide if they want to provide comment or not on January 28th. And then you will do the same on February 5th. We'll forward you their comments if you would like to know them. Um, 
the state puts out a list for you to comment on, so they list the criteria and you can kind of fill it out, or you can write a supplemental letter to attach to that list. But um, it looks at very specific things like what is the integrity? Did they provide a good description? Is there significance? Did they provide all the supporting materials? Things like that. Um, so it's a very technical in nature as to if it ought to be designated. Does it meet the designation criteria? Um, oops, hold on. Did I miss something? No, I did not. That's all I have. I just wanted to chat about what the process is, acknowledge publicly that it came in. So if the public was wondering where it is in this process, they um, know I did contact um, the group that submitted the nomination. They're aware of the process moving forward as well. So they're, they're welcome to show up to Historic Review Board and um, City Commission to the extent that you'll take testimony on that as well. But again, the commission is not obligated to make comments. You can make comments if you want to make comments. If both the Historic Review Board and the City Commission state that they don't believe that it's actually eligible, then it doesn't really move forward. Um, although I would expect the Historic Review Board to probably say that it is eligible. So um, we'll see. Questions? And then staff will probably have some type of staff report or recommendation to HRB that we'll give to you as well. So I think the only the other follow up is that we received a question concerning is the Buena Vista House part of the park and would it be required to go to a vote of the people to sell or remove the building if it is part of the park per the charter? And so I don't know, Bill, want to kind of sure. we had the attorney look at this question. Yeah, I guess the first comment I'd make is that when this, the chapter 10 of the charter that talks about parks and natural beauty was written, this is not what's anticipated. And so, you know, it's it's not as clear as it could be, but I'll go through some, some basic things. Typically when you talk about property, you know, what, well, let's talk about section 41, which is a key provision. It says the commission may not do any of the following listed acts with regard to any designated city park or part thereof without first obtaining a vote. So it's a prohibition on the city doing, the, the city commission doing anything. And so if you're to sit back and do nothing, you, you're not going to violate the charter. Um, and so, you know, this was nominated by a group of citizens. The decision is made by the National Park Service. So, you know, that that's that's step one. Second thing is, you, you know, the, what the prohibitions are, one, you can't sell, lease, or otherwise transfer park property or vacate or otherwise change the legal status of any park. So the first question, is the Buena Vista Club part of the park? As I understand, it was moved there sometimes in the, the Atkinson Park was created some time ago. It was moved there sometime in the 30s. 1970, in the actual chapter 10, lists Atkinson Park, including the area on which it's cited as part of the, uh, as one of the charter parks. Typically, when you talk about real property, structures on that property are considered part of the property. It's not completely clear, but there is another hint in the, in the charter. One of the things the prohibition says is you cannot construct permanent buildings or structures thereon other than for recreational purposes. In any case where at the date of adoption of this section there are existing structures which do not comply with this provision, such structures and any additions and alterations thereto are accepted from the provision, provisions of this structure. So if you've got an existing structure that doesn't comply, by not complying, the prohibition is can't build anything except for recreation and maintenance. So if it's recreation and maintenance, it complies. But if it doesn't comply, you know, let's say you had designated an area as a park and it has a warehouse on it. What this says is structures that don't comply, any additions or alterations there to are, are accepted from the provision of this section. So it seems to sort of treat structures differently than the park. You know, which is contrary to what I said earlier that, you know, typically real estate includes structures. So, again, it's not clear. It wasn't made for this. My initial read on it is that, yeah, this building is part of the park. If, you know, just as a straightforward question. Um, the second question, would you need a vote to, to sell or relocate? Clearly, to sell, you'd have to, because it says if you're going to sell, lease, or otherwise transfer park property, if this is part of the park, if you sell it, you're going to have to do it. Relocate, and that depends on what's happening with it. If it's 
relocating to property owned by the county, then you're probably transferring the park property. And so you're going to do it. If you're going to move it from one park and move it to, you know, Clackamas Park, maybe not because you're not, you know, it's not sell, lease, or otherwise transfer. But you could also say transferring it from location changes of parks and ag again, but again, at a first blush, straightforward reading, you're not transferring it as as I would read that what if about you're demolition? just looking at demolition. It doesn't talk very much about demolition and stepping back from the context. In 1970, it was parks and natural beauty. And one of the things it talks about is natural parks and sort of encouraging natural parks. And what it says, you can't sell, lease, or transfer. You can't vacate or otherwise change legal status or construct permanent buildings. It seems to want to preserve things in a natural state. And it doesn't talk about demolition. You know, what it says is you can't do any of the listed items without a vote of the people. It says you can't sell, lease, or transfer. You can't vacate or otherwise change legal status. Where you can't construct things. So there's nothing in there that says we couldn't demo the building. That's my first read on it. You know, could somebody say you get rid of the building? Does that change the legal status of any park? Maybe as a stretch, but I don't think that covers it. You know, um, so my first, you know, straightforward reading, it doesn't say anything about demolition. It says you, you can't construct buildings on it without um, getting a vote of the people. Okay. And I've got to say, it's not completely clear and obvious, you know, and a court may end up going a different way, but I do think you as a commission, there's some cases out there talk about commissions have the authority to interpret um, language of the charter in the first instance, and there will be some deference to it. So um, from, a, from a practical standpoint, when we think about the demolition component, because we've talked about this a little bit, is that we, we do go into parks that are identified as charter parks or otherwise. And we do, we demolish playground equipment. We demolish restrooms. We've rebuilt restrooms, right? I mean, but those are all around recreational use. So we've never thought about demolishing something and needing to take it to the vote of the people, whether it was a charter park or not, historically. Right. Um, we agree it's, I don't think it anticipated this question when this was written. So I think that's where the commission is gonna need to make a decision on how they want to interpret that provision should we should that become an issue um, moving forward questions i might as well go i have a lot of thoughts on it i'll kick it off you know we went to the demolition piece i mean de demolition is final and it can't be changed or undone and i get that and i've surveyed the community and i've got a number of respondents and quite honestly most people don't know what it is don't know where it is don't know anything about it. Uh, there's a small group of enthusiastic people that are pursuing this, and I, I get that. Uh, I also know that this group has a responsibility to the community as a whole. And uh, the question is, and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry this process got out of sync, because I thought we were going to come back and talk about you know, dollars that we would need to, to refurbish. Even the infra, this is actually the best report I've seen so far, and I it generates even more questions about um, the waivers you can get on on this, the condition of the building because that's something I brought up and was immediately shot down, you know, and and not by this by by people in the audience. And I struggle with this application a little bit because the tact is history. Yet all the conversations I've had with members of that group, and not all of them, and I, I won't speak for Commissioner Smith or or our other commissioners. They want it for a meeting room, and they want it for a meeting room because, in their humble opinion, it, it doesn't, because of its location out of the way, it won't generate the traffic needed to support it as a historical artifact. So we're, we're using history to get something, in my opinion, we don't need, which is another meeting room. Um, you know, I've been over there three times. I say about the responsibility of the entire OC population. I think the report is a little bit flowery. I mean, when I went over there with one of the members of the group, and they, they talked about having ADA accessibility in this report, yet when I was there, I was told, well, the only way to get efficient ADA responsibility is through the kitchen area, which means we have to cut down this beautiful cedar tree. And we all know how well cutting down trees flies in this community. <laughs> so, you know, the questions I posed, 
you know, I posed the first question, which was just answered, is the structure considered part of the Atkinson Park? I'm curious if anybody knows the possible grant amounts. And I see that if, if this does attain the status, it says, say we say we say that some members of this commission did want to demolish it, it requires a hearing. Well, that being said, you know, is a vote of the population of Oregon City uh, considered a, an, an avenue that could be pursued? Do you want, once we have the dollar amounts defined, do you want to spend X amount of dollars to refurbish this building to this condition? Is that is that a proper, does it fulfill the requirements of this, this pursuit that's being done now? Would it give us direction as to either do it or don't do it? Because it says we have to hold a meeting if we're pursuing demolition. Well, only if it, only if it achieves this status. Well, considering the evaluators are historic review board, and I, I, um, I kind of think it will. So let's assume that it does. If it achieves that status, if, if a prevailing number of members of this community wanted to demolish it, oh. is a vote of the people a proper avenue to pursue? The commission could do that. I don't think the charter requires a vote to demolish it. You mean more like an advisory vote? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think you can. I, I, think an advisory vote I think at the end of the day, whether you have an advisory vote or not, the commission has to make a decision, and I think that that could be considered as as part of the decision making process, just like other things would be considered on whether to demolish it or not. Um, I don't know. Just sending it straight to a vote and get you out of a public hearing requirement. I don't think it would. I don't think so. I think you still need the, the public hearing. The other avenue I wanted to pursue, because quite honestly, and I'll, I'll say it right out, I'm not willing to put money into this house. I have so many demands. This commission has so many demands for money to help this community, much of which is park generated, that I'm not willing to do this. However, I also said I'm not willing to stand in the way of a private organization that could undertake this. And if they could, I, I mean, I would love to just transfer a title to a willing group, and I presumably that must require a vote too, because now I'm transferring park property by definition. But I don't want to stand in the way of an of a enthusiastic group that wants to do it, but I also am I'm unwilling to spend community funds to do it. And that's a straight. Are you done? Yes. Commissioner Lassman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. Turway, um, what. Can you explain really quickly again, what is the HRB reviewing? And you mentioned providing comments and maybe providing comments on a list of criteria. So can you say that again? Like, are they reviewing the application for a, for a specific list of things? And if we comment, we, we would need to be commenting on those specific list of things or we can comment whatever we want or, or what? Yeah, the state and ultimately the National Park Service look at their criteria for designation. So it's sort of outside of the purview of what to do if it's designated. It's does it have the integrity to be designated? Did they do a good job in this application explaining how significant it is? Do Is their information correct and they have the right facts and supporting materials to make that case? So it's really a narrow purview. It's should it, does it have the um, story to be designated? And is that story told well enough? And it's mm -hmm. that narrow. And so okay. that's what HRB will look at. And the city commission can review and has the option to comment as well. You can always do supplemental letters or explanations on things that are not related to that. Like, well, we don't want it designated or we do want it designated because of these reasons. And um, I mean, they'll look at it, but really the criteria that they're looking at is, does it meet the, does it tell the story well enough and has it been documented well enough? Okay, thanks. Trish Smith. Um, so this is from this is a re response to Commissioner O'Donnell's um, comment about not wanting to put money into this building. It will cost you $100,000 to tear it down. So if you don't want to put money into this building, let it sit there. 
I think it was eighty to a hundred thousand dollars somewhere. Even I mean, that's my ballpark remembering it, what it was to tear the building down. So you don't spend a lot of money if you tear this building down. Money that could go towards preserving it um, and just letting it, or just letting it sit there until we find out what resources this other group it can find. And I'll, I'll, the only response I'll say, Commissioner Smith, is I'm. I'm aware of another figure that said twenty thousand dollars to demolish it. So I, I don't know how reliable any of those figures are. Well, twenty thousand dollars is still money that you said you didn't want to spend on that building. Okay. Well, I, I don't think we're gonna um, we're not debating this particular issue tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just being informed about the process. Uh, I assume that the, this February twenty seventh uh, hearing they will take testimony. Yes. So it says. Okay. From supposedly the leading official in the community, right? That's what that, what the what the document reads. Um, yeah, I talked to the state. They, anyone can come. Um, right. Or, or we could submit a letter. Mm -hmm. okay. See, the point is, I'm probably not going to take issue with what's been said historically. I mean, maybe there's some that would. I'm certainly not going to. I don't consider myself an expert. And I don't think other considerations are even relevant for this review that's going to be done. This is a straight, as you said, a very narrow review. So then the question is, you know, what, what do we do after that fact? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we're on to 19729, amendments to Oregon City Municipal Code. Ms. Turway. All right, thank you very much. I am pleased to introduce um, our acting building official, Scott Caulfield. Good evening, Mayor Holiday, Chair uh, Scott Caulfield, Acting Building Official. Uh, my great pleasure to be with you tonight, um, filling in for Mike Roberts, uh, who, as you know, is out for extended leave. And the matter we bring before you tonight is uh, some proposed Oregon City Municipal Code amendments relating to the um, the general administrative provisions for uh, 1504, which are the uh, the the, the uh, general authorizations for the administration of the building code here in Oregon City. And the reason we're bringing these to you is that there have been some recent amendments to the state building code which have kind of sliced out this whole category of um, uh, structure types um, that have historically been in the code and are now removed. And so without placing language in the municipal code that gives you authority to regulate these kinds of structures, um, you wouldn't have authority to do so. Uh, and so um, I thought it would be helpful to bring this to you, inform you of the change, give you an opportunity to ask questions. And I could also offer a very brief history um, to just to give you a sense of how these ended up here. Well, it's not the summary of the fact that the state is now going to abdicate that area of responsibility and we as a local jurisdiction need to take it on. Otherwise, it goes uncontrolled. That's and correct. Is that a one sentence summary? Of yep, that's a one sentence summary. Okay. No, that's exactly right. I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. All right, and then just process question. Lander with the process question. Um, so we would like to come back at the January 15th meeting and do a first and second reading declaring an emergency since this was effective January 1st. Is that okay or would you prefer multiple readings? Is there anything, um, anything pending that is pursuant to this? No. Um, these are for commercial build. These are, these only apply to commercial. There's generally few applications on these types of items. There could be an application that someone wants to submit, but no. I prefer. I, I don't like the emergency clause, just as a general rule. And seeing there really isn't an emergency here, it's not like we have an issue that we want to resolve so that we, you know, we can get this in the code. I'd rather we do it in two meetings. But if, if, if the the can, my concern would be two years from now we find some unpermitted structure that's on this list and they say, oh no, I built it in January of 2020 when you had no controls over it. And that's, you know, really, you know, we're not going to see an application because... So is this really an emergency, Mr. Kabeisman? The, the question is whether or not this is, could pre 
provide problems later down the road. And I think it could, the smaller we keep that window, the less potential right. problems. Can, can I comment? Sure. I, I understand that position, certainly. Did we have no advance notice? Did this catch us unawares or how long? That's we... correct. Um, Building Codes Division, uh, we were notified the day it was effective. And that was in October. And so we've spent the last few months working with other jurisdictions, trying to figure out what, what this means and how to move forward. And then we had some staff changes with our building official internally. Okay, all right, we can do it for a second reading. That's fine on the 15th. Sure. Agreed. Yeah. I, I would support that. I, I think the, the more that we have control over these things, the better, because I agree with you, Bill, that uh, we've been in a situation before where somebody said, oh, I did this before the code, and there we are. We're hung out to dry. And the sooner we get this passed, the, the better. I, I would, however, um, just as information, want to see what the state definition is of demolition and you said this applies to commercial because i did bring up a couple of times about a couple of buildings in town one of them is already demolished the other one's still standing there so that's just a an aside request not just information that you can send us later or send me later okay you got that. thank you all right then we're on to mr manager you got any for us tonight um just an update that um the small business revolution is an online tv show and it will be and uh they came and did an interview with oregon city so it's one of the cities being considered it's announcing their top five cities uh, for their f season five sh season five series on january 14th at 4 a.m. West Coast, 7 a.m. East Coast. At what time? 4 a.m. 4 a.m. Um, so watch your Twitter, our Facebook page, um, to log on to their online show, their website, uh, to see if we're one of the top five. If so, if we're selected, we have seven days to vote for our city. The city with the, with the most votes after that week wins. You're allowed one vote for each unique email address per device per day. Voting ends January 21st. An announcement of the winner will be January 28th. <laughs> winning vote takes all. So the Small Business Revolution will bring about a half a million dollars uh, to the winning city to help benefit uh, the community uh, with a spotlight on vital impact that small businesses have in our community. So um, really promote it if we're really promote it. Yep. And we'll be pushing it out um, on our social media websites and whatnot um, on the 14th when we're one of the top five. No, we're not. We're, we're right in the sweet spot. Uh, the other uh, announcement is just a reminder. Hopefully, I uh, have a chance to look at your calendars. We, we've got a date that works to, uh, for a meeting with the Grand Round Tribal Council. It's scheduled for Wednesday, January 29th uh, at 6 p.m. I believe we'll be meeting over at the library, but we'll provide more information as that date gets closer. Okay. That's all that I have for tonight. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. So this is a meeting that we're having, so it'll be announced and it's open to the public. Yes. But it'll be basically just like a regular meeting that we're having, except we're going to be having a kind of a discussion. Yeah, I think it's more of a opportunity. A meet and greet. To, uh, meet and, yeah, we're still deciding. I don't know if we're going to do all the formality of taping and sitting around. I think we're going to, we're still working through some of the logistics of how the, 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 the introductions and meetings will go. But essentially, it's an opportunity to sit down with the Grand Ronde tri tri Tribal Council um, and just start some communications with them. Hopefully we can Great. set the room up so that it is really conducive to conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, not the typical rows where we're all sitting in a line and we can't see each other, that type of thing. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any reports they wish to give on their particular things? Um, I do, but I need to look something sure. up in the calendar real quick. I can go. Commissioner Law Smith. So the Citizen Involvement Committee um, met last night. Seems so long ago, but it was just last night. Um, <laughs> I uh, I just kind of wanted to, to give folks a, head up, a heads up. I think um, both Park Place Neighborhood and Barclay Hills Neighborhood Association have, you know, some serious concerns about a lack of crosswalks or some crosswalks that that need, um, you know, either blinking signals. Um, I think. Um, you know, their their intention, they've got an approval from, from TAC, it's gonna come back to us. Um, just a heads up, there was some discussion about discretionary funds and the amount, you know, that was in that pot and that we had some discretion with that pot of money in order to like implement some crosswalks that would be really beneficial to the public. So um, 
I guess I was just just a, a teaser, I guess, a little bit of, of something to think about that's, that is definitely coming. Um, I know that I've talked with um, John Lewis about those the crossing uh, crosswalks with the blinky lights. I think the average cost that he told me could be around $35,000, um, but they seem to be a hot topic among the neighborhoods, um, just because I think with cars and traffic, there's a lot of concerns about pedestrians, maybe a lot of near misses. And so um, in general, I think this is a, a topic of concern for all of the neighborhoods, but these, particular, these two neighborhoods particularly are gonna um, be bringing some requests, I think, before the city commission um, about some areas that fe they feel like are um, of, of heightened need, I, I would say. Um, and I, I, oh, and they also have a work group uh, formed. If you'll remember, they came before us and asked us about uh, revising their bylaws, which included their voting membership and stuff like that. Um, I reiterated to them that yes, they. It, it needed to be fully in place and voted on and approved by the city commission before they could start implementing changes. Um, so they have a work group that's going to uh, start working on that stuff right away. Okay. Anybody else, Commissioner Griff? Um, yes, I just wanted to report out that the Downtown Oregon City Association is going to have a um, sort of a board retreat we won't be going anywhere, but we'll be in town to talk about the um, projects and, and the work plan for the year. It's, it's kind of been fleshed out already, but we need to have further in-depth discussion about it. And then um, Willamette Falls and Landings Heritage Area, um, the group will be meeting next week, but they also asked me to express their um, thanks for the uh, allowing the presentation uh, last month. And they uh, feel very, very confident that um, Hopefully, once the Congress is less distracted, which I don't know when that will be, uh, that this <laughs> this project will be able to move forward. It's obviously been delayed by some other issues going on in Washington D.C. So that is it for that. Okay. Um, so I have a couple things. Um, the Blount Falls Locks Commission has come close to wrapping up our uh, our work. Uh, we've put in for a. Uh, legislative fix and money to start coming in this short session. We expect that legislation to move forward now that we have a, we actually have a plan and you know, who's going to own it and operate it and all that sort of thing. So we're going to be forming a public corporation somewhat like OHSU that will just be in charge of, of dealing with that. Um, so as that moves forward, I'll keep you updated. Um, South Fork Water Board, um, I will not be, I'll be vice chair this year, but um, I'm not sure if everybody knows, can we, no? Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and uh, the Legacy Project, uh, we, I just got an email today um, that because the Grand Ronde uh, purchased the property um, and they wish to have us, instead of going down Main Street to access the phase one of the Riverwalk project, they want to go us to go down the bank right from the corner of 99 and, and that way. And so there are some bridging things that have to be take, talked about and taken care of. Um, they've applied for a grant of about a million dollars. Um, so we've delayed the, uh, the start of the project for a year in order to be able to make all that stuff happen. So we were planning on breaking ground this year, and now it's going to be delayed till next year. Has someone Are you at the Riverwalk? Hmm? Jump at the Riverwalk or their work? The river no, the Riverwalk. Walk. Has someone removed all the posters from downtown Oregon City that say 2020? <laughs> well, <laughs> we like, start I, doing I, that. like I said, I just got the email today. Because <laughs> there's signs all over. So I guess I would ask the question about how that change is going to affect the master plan. Because that doesn't seem like that is totally in sync with the master plan. Well, it, 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 actually, it's better for us, you know, this way because uh, the big thing that the Grand Ronde had was how do you secure the site and let, it's still letting people walk down Main Street to get to the to the phase one, and so this would would basically fence everybody off from getting into the rest of the site, and they've committed that they were going going to. 
um, if, if we go this direction that they're going to pay for it, most, if not all, of, of the bridging stuff that we would need to have to get from point A to point B. You want to try to explain that a little better? <laughs> so it, the mayor the mayor is correct. The, there was the, the original plan was to utilize uh, temporary interim parking, come down Main Street mm -hmm. into what would have been um, the yard area and then bridge up in or go down Main Street all the way to the PG dam around along the dam over to phase one. Um, so we're trying to work with uh, Grand Ronde to address their concerns about public access, safety, construction equipment in there. So they proposed coming along the river edge. Um, and so I think it's really trying to work with them you know, they, and, and to come up with, see what they come up with it as, in a, as a design and how closely that reflects what we've adopted in the vision document. And so they're working with their consultants right now in, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the, the, ta the technical advisory committee that we've put together with all the jurisdictions and checking in to see where we're, where we're at in that process, see what their design looks like, how consistent is it with uh, what was in that river in the original vision document. So I don't know that we're at a place right now to, to say that if it is or it isn't consistent with the with the plan that's been adopted, I think the intent is to be as consistent as we can be because the objective is to um, try to provide that access where it was actually intended um, through that river walk process. And I think that's part of the reason we're going to have a, a joint meeting is to kind of you know have some general discussions about that kind of folks you know with the travel council. Yeah, I think the public's going to be very disappointed about the delay and groundbreaking. Yeah, I, mean, I think so. Too. We need to do something, For sure. you know, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Especially since anybody else? It's been advertised everywhere. Or adjourn.